All right, well, today we're going to go through, this is the, the opener for the, uh, for breaks. So I'm going to run you all through this right quick. I don't think it's going to take all that long. If anything, you, if you're not foggy about anything, you're probably going to pick up on a lectude, which you don't get here. That make sense? And, uh, so everybody understands the lectude is good. It is our friend, right? And uh, you're going to you're going to work on that stuff, right? Get it done. You know, you know, you can get in trouble by not getting your lectude done. You don't you don't want to go there. You're supposed to shake your head. Oh yeah, yeah no, I don't want to happen to that. You know. Right. So. Uh, break the principles of physics. Everybody knows about all these parts here. We used to spend a lot of time on that. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion, right? Heat energy is the energy of friction. So whenever you hit the brake, you're taking the motion energy, the motion of the car going along, and you're converting it to heat energy, and that's stopping the car. And the brake pads are basically made to do that. Power, weight, velocity, that's kinetic energy. The MK vents around. Heat energy is being produced by your engine while it's driving it. And it's delivering that power to the wheels. It's turning it, turns it into a kinetic energy, which is driving. When you mash the brake, you're going to turn it into heat energy. Braking got more energy, requires more energy. Ten seconds, uh, three to four seconds, sixty miles an hour. You know, zero to sixty, ten seconds. So basically, uh, takes a lot more energy to stop you than it does to get you going. Because you're fighting inertia. That's basically what that's about. Brake pads pinch the rotor. Everybody knows that. Got a dry surface, got good traction. Who's, a, who's hit the brakes on a slippery road and went to sliding? Have you ever been sliding and trying to turn your wheels and it kept going straight? That's why you have anti-lock brakes, because if the brakes are pulsing and it's still rolling the wheel, you're still steering the car. You can't steer it otherwise. Sonia, what you need? Yeah, I'm doing a PowerPoint. All right, come on. All right, so this ain't complicated here. All right, so if you got balance, brake forward, front back, balance on a wide range of loadings. If you got a heavy load in the back, you're going to need more braking in the back. So it's over an equal side to side. You know, if obviously, how many of you ever hit the brake and had it pulled to one side? And that's what's typically, what's typically the reason for that? You got any idea? But a lot of different things make pull to one side. Stopped up brake hose. You can have something wrong with the pads on that side. You have a sticking caliper on that side. You can actually have front end problems, steering issues, or steering components that are worn out that will actually change the dynamics of the steering geometry and cause it to go one way, or, you know, like that. All right, so you got 12 pounds of force here, 48 pounds of lift here. Some of you guys have already been here and elected looking at that, doing the math. You did it the other day, didn't you? All right, that's Pascal's law. Everywhere is one PSI throughout the system. Whenever you're putting one PSI here everywhere and one PSI there everywhere, since you've got more square inches, you're going to have more pressure and more and all that. All right? Okay, you're going to move one inch here, you're going to move a half inch there because it's twice as big. Got it? You don't move as far, but you move with twice as much force. You're going to have to trade off on that. Uh, so if you basically have got a, you know, one that's half as big as that one, it's going to move twice as far, but only half as much pressure. So if you put 10 pounds here, you're going to get 5 pounds down there. If you're using a little piston, you're going to double your force up here. Kink hoses, pinch brake lines. Have you seen any leak in brake lines? You guys saw some of the uh, Impala last semester. There was some of the best. We had to replace every single brake line hmm. on this rusty Impala. This was a horror story. It was probably going to lift when you came up here that other time. And we got it all done eventually. Fuel lines were leaking and all kinds of stuff. Wrong. It came from New York. And uh, you were saying that, uh, and he made the, a little quip. He basically said that uh, his dad told him that in New York, cars rush from the bottom up, and here they rush from the top down. And that one there illustrated that principle. All right, so you might notice right here, your brake pedal, your foot's way down here. There's a lot of difference between your foot, just between your foot and here, and then your little fulcrum is way up here. So that gives you, you're multiplying that by the length of that brake pedal. You got your master cylinder, you got your wheel cylinder here for the rear brakes. If you've got drum brakes on the rear, and then you're pinching that on that. So, dot three premiums, uh, physics, you know, this is basically giving you your boiling point and all that. Four dot three exceeds federal requirements. 
you know, for that. But here's another thing. Don't leave the top off the brake fluid can between your stuff you're doing because it absorbs moisture. You know what the word hygroscopic means? It means it absorbs moisture. That's not hard to figure, is it? Okay, we want to see. Look at it, All right. The components in operation, gasket, diaphragm, reservoir. If you take the reservoir cover off and it's all swelled up and ugly and fat, that means somebody has put oil-based compound of some kind in the brakes and it swells the rubber up. What happens if you put oil in there and it swells all the rubber up? Well, the brakes actually lock up and the car won't go nowhere. And, um, you know, that kind of thing has to happen. Not here, but I've heard of people saying they went somewhere and somebody put the wrong stuff in their master cylinder. You pay attention to what you're doing and make sure you know where to put the fluid. This one lady put, filled her engine up with water thinking she was putting in the radiator because the two, the two fills were real close and she just put, took the wrong one off and she kept pouring, pouring it in there because she, she could see the water and she was pouring it in the motor. And, uh, true story. Uh, all right, uh, tandem master cylinder. If you're breaking force here, if you got a leak right there, you're always going to have issues. And the, the little proportioning valve, which I'll show you a little bit in a minute, Actually, put a little piston in there, though, if you lose pressure on one side, it moves that little thing uh, to inside of it so that it grounds the wire and turns on the red brake light, and you'll feel it on your pedal, too. Basically, when you got brake problems, you're going to feel pulsation of the pedal, you're going to feel it, the pedal going all the way down to the floor or being real spongy or something like that. It's basically what you're most of the time looking for, the feel and the height of the pedal. I actually handed you guys a worksheet on checking pedal height. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a pedal height checking worksheet on that. Uh, di diagonal piping for the front, you know, for the front engine, front drive. The way that the thing is piped is going to be really important because sometimes it's actually this one and that one's hooked together and that one and that one's hooked together. And that is going to affect what? The way you bleed the brakes, right? And his Nissan in here, uh, Gene Taylor's Nissan, had a, uh, he had, had an accident on it and they fixed it. All up. And that brake pedal never felt right until we bled the brakes the way Nissan said they were supposed to be bred in the right order. You know, uh, that makes all the difference in the world. That's what's inside your master cylinder right there. You got a primary piston, you got a secondary piston, this little screws will hold it all in there. Uh, of course, you got a little uh, snap ring back here. And that's the little innards of the master cylinder. Single bore separated into two separate chambers. And look at this, this is really important. You're going to see this on your final. You better memorize it. You better take a picture of your phone or something. Now, this right here is your compensating port. Who can remember this? That is the compensating port. This is the fluid inlet port. This is the return spring. Notice what that piston cup does when you let off. It rolls that thing forward to let the fluid pass it going that way. And then whenever you push it, it seals. But that compensating port is a really important item that you need to know what that is. See, the compensating port is actually uh, behind the piston at this particular point. Uh, so anyway, this actually lets the fluid go in there that you're going to use to do your braking. And so whenever the, after the piston is returned, its original position fluid returned from the wheel cylinder circuit through the compensating port, it comes this way. See that? So that it, it lets, uh, when the fluid, the springs on the rear brakes are trying to pull the shoes in, the little seal around the uh, caliper piston is actually moving it in. Well, the fluid that's being pushed back by that re return has got to go somewhere, so it goes back into the reservoir through that compensating port. All right, there's your compensating port on this one here. So you got the different, that's the Toyota uh, thing. All right, so friction material here. You got a brake drum, you got friction material there. Uh, there's your little brush piston seal. This is the part, this is also on your final. Don't forget this point. That little piston seal is actually doubles as a spring. It distorts. And then it, whenever it returns to, it's got a memory. Rubber's got a memory, you know. When it comes back to its shape, it's basically going to pull that piston back. And uh, as you uh, apply your brakes again and again and again, you start to wear them out, you might notice your brake fluid goes low. You gotta put more brake fluid in there. Let's say somebody says, I crank up car up in the morning and I drive it, and the brake light comes on as soon as I get in and crank it up, and then it goes off by the time I get down to my favorite stop sign. That means it's a little fluid, because the fluid expands a little bit with the heat of the engine compartment, right? Anytime you hear anybody talking about that, put some fluid in there, take care of it. If I see a red brake light, well, the first place I'm going is a reservoir, see if it's full of fluid. And about 85% of the time, it's a little fluid, especially with brake pedal. Uh, that was my boss. Okay, right here, components in operation, internally vented rotor. You might see some that aren't vented, some that are vented. Uh, what's the problem you see if this is all clogged up with dirt? May run hot, right? Mm -hmm. Brake may run hot. Here's something else you might want to think about. You remember I was talking about manual transmission and everything? Uh, overheat because they run low on juice and all that? Did you know that your manual transmission can overheat because of brakes dragging? 
think about it. It's got to pull. It's got to work that much harder, especially on a small vehicle. Anything that's pulling, it pulls up really hard. It may, it's going to heat those gears up. Keep up with that. All right. Now this one right here, if the caliper doesn't slide smooth, the pads will wear unevenly. If you're changing out disc uh, pads, grab this thing right here and make sure it works smoothly. If it doesn't, you may have to take a caliper bracket and pull and work that thing out of there and clean it up and put grease in there. And there is a hardware kit you can get put new boots on there. So if you need new boots and hardware, and if somebody, here's a really important point. If somebody comes in here and they got brakes that are all haywired together and they got duct tape and bailing wire on them, all that kind of stuff, you don't let the vehicle go until they let you fix it in the right way. Because if you let it out of here, if they say, well, I don't want any of that work done, just put it back together. Well, if you put it back together with bailing wire and duct tape and they crash, it's on you. What you do is say is we're going to fix it or we're going to disable it, so you've got to send a wrecker after it. But we ain't going to let you drive it out of here with bailing wire and duct tape on it. It may have come in here that way, but it ain't going out that way. See what I'm saying? You're protecting the shop and everybody else. You say, I ain't letting this thing out of my service bay until we put all the parts on it. You don't run into that too sooner or later. You see them brake pads that are worn out and wrong? See that? See that screwed up? You ever seen them where the one side of the pads wore out more than the other side? That kind of stuff. That's typically because the caliper slide's not working. All right. And these right here have got a little screw in there that's for your park brakes. And as the park brakes operate, it keeps screwing up farther and farther out. Now you can't just push those back up in there. There's a worksheet you're going to get where you got to screw some back up in there with that special tool. You basically use a tool that goes against this and screws that back in there. And uh, Michelle Goosby's uh, Ford 500 does this. You have to screw it back in there. A lot of vehicles do. Uh, the ones with got the brake rotors, brake uh, pick shoes in the hat, like the Crown Victoria and Chevy pickup, you don't have this kind of caliper on them. But the ones that use the, the disc for the uh, caliper, in other words, they use a disc for the park brake, the, the disc brake for the park brake, they're going to have that. All right. This right here is a tone ring for your ABS sensor. This is going to be on your final, don't forget it. Tone ring for the APS sensors right here. Here's your service brake pads. There's your parking brake shoes on the cat. It's got the hat. And there's your little bearing down in there. All right? All right, so this right here is your, whenever we used to do brakes when I was working at uh, that shop back in 1977, every time we did brakes on one, we would take those wheel soldiers apart, we would haul them out, we'd put new rubber parts in them. Every single time. Nobody does that anymore that I know about. You know why? Because these things are cheap as dirt. Most of the time, eight, ten dollars, you can get a new wheel somewhere. Secondly, whenever you're working on drum brakes, everything may look just fine. It may look just and dry. If you're supposed to grab these boots and pull them back to see if they got if they're wet in here, that means that those seals are leaking. And you're gonna have to put a wheel somewhere on them. Or at the very least we build out, you gotta have a home, make sure you know all that. A whole lot better is putting new wheels on them. Long and short of it is, when you're doing brakes, make sure there's one work teacher you're going to get where you're going to pull, pull a wheel cylinder off, tear it apart, put it back together, because you didn't know how that thing goes together. And there you got a spring, you got two boots, you got no seal. These have got to be the right size and all that if you're rebuilding a wheel cylinder. Now think about these. This is also on your final. Don't miss this. These are leading trailing brakes, these are dual servo brakes. You got it? Leading trailing, what's the difference between the two? What did you work on today? The brake shoe. I understand that, but which part of these? Spring. That one, right? Yeah. You worked on the dual servo brake. This is the leading trailing. What sets it apart? This is anchored at the bottom, and then the top obviously is anchored called the wheel center. This one right here is not anchored at the bottom, it moves. Got it? So dual servo is the one that moves. The short shoe goes to the front. Long shoe goes to the back. Well, this one here, the shoes are both pretty much the same. Okay, you got it? All right, now then, lead and shoe makes contact with the drum. On that one there. And this is not even energized when you're going forward. See, on that one there. Trail and shoe makes contact with the drum here. Rotation forces the shoe away. So it's not going to be... It works better in reverse. It's really kind of odd because it looks like it's only uh, the rear shoe brakes when you're backing up, the front shoe brakes when you're going forward. But on this one here, the primary shoe makes contact and it forces that wide, that big other shoe into the back. Now most of the time, those uh, leading trailing brakes that are anchored at the bottom and the top are going to be on the back of front wheel drive cars, like the Oldsmobile or one of them cars. You'll usually see those kind there. Pickup trucks, 
will have the kind of brakes that he took apart this morning. What did what was your time? What was the best time you got on taking the brake shoes off, putting them back on? Three forty-five. Three minutes and forty-five seconds. You guys have that time to beat. Okay. All right. Now then, uh, neural pin. Some of them's got a little adjuster up top. If you see the adjuster up here under the wheel cylinder, that's going to be leading trailing. Can you remember that? If you see the adjuster up there under the wheel cylinder, is leading trailing brakes. That's what that is. And, uh, the one-shot adjuster is kind of adjusts the clearance. Uh, by a single uh, occasion. Now, I like the ones on some of the old Volkswagen rabbits had a little wedge that just basically had a spring on it. And when you mashed it, it automatically pulled down and it kept the brakes out there perfect. I don't know how some more people to do that. It's so cool. All right. There's your dual servo incremental adjuster. Every time you operate the brakes, if they move very far, it's going to go yink, yink, yink. And it's going to, you saw that little thing, what you do this morning. And there's your adjuster assembly. On, the, on that one there. Remember, it's right under the master cylinder. What kind are these? What kind are these? Leading oh, trailing. Leading trailing. That's right. That's what I wanted to hear. Now, here's your components and operation of your brake booster. Uh, what is it that makes the brake booster help you? One reason it's big is you got to need a lot of square inches in there. And so what you're going to do, and I'm just going to give you a real rundown on this, you got vacuum all the way throughout this whole thing. Well, when you hit the brake, that vacuum is closed off so that it's no longer back here and atmosphere is allowed in. So the atmosphere is how many pounds per square inch? At sea level? 14 and a half, 14.7, something like that. Think about your stoichiometric in the engine. 14.7 to 1, 14.7 pounds of air per square inch pretty much. So what you wind up with, if you've got 10 square inches on the back of that diaphragm, Multiply that times 14.7, that's 147 pounds of pressure that you're, giving, that you're, that you're getting help by. And that the, because there's no pressure here and there's pressure back here, the pressure differential. Uh, you got low pressure on both sides, right there, low pressure, low pressure. All right, now you got high pressure when you move this little spool valve, closes off the vacuum and lets atmosphere in. See how that works? It's in the applied position, that's in the holding position. Still got atmosphere here, but you're not you know, applying any additional, you're just holding the brake, but you're not actually putting additional pressure on it. Atmospheric port's closed, vacuum port's closed, they're both closed. It's just holding. It's like what? All right, so some of them, power hydraulic brake system uses power steering pressure uh, supplied by a power steering pump to provide power assist for the brake system. All this stuff you're going to see rolling on your final here. Uh, it receives pressure from the power steering system, so it's got a brake booster valve and there's an accumulator in there. And that accumulator gives you an additional brake application if your power steering pump, you know, pressure goes away or whatever. And uh, it causes the fluid to flow through it creates boost. And basically there's your little accumulator piston and all that. That's a safety feature. All right. So uh, here's the components and operation of proportioning valve, metering valve. Proportioning valve regulates brake force on the rear brake system. Metering valve is used to equalize hydraulic pressure on the vehicle to use front and rear front disc and rear drum brakes. Both of those are so close to the same thing, it's going to be difficult to tell them apart. Sometimes the proportioning valve will just be in the line going to the back uh, wheels cylinders and it'll look like a filter or something. Uh, basically, why do you don't want the rear brakes getting pressure before the front ones have applied? What would be the problem with that? Why not just let them apply however they want to? What if you're going into a curve forward. and it's a little bit rainy mm -hmm. and then a deer runs across the road? and you hit the brake, and the rear brakes lock up before the front would do, you suddenly got yourself in a handbrake turn. You ever do a handbrake turn? Hmm? Anybody ever do a handbrake turn? Yeah. If you've done it before, it ain't a big deal. But if you hadn't done it before, it scares the living daylight out of you. You know what in a Sam Hill to do. You're, ah, you know, all this stuff. Sort of. But I mean, uh, we used to do it for the fun of it, you know. Pretty much. Uh, really. But uh, anyway, long and short of that's whenever you, when you jerk your partner again, right? <laughs> All right, and so basically some of them got, you'll see under the back, by the rear axle, a height sensing proportioning valve on some of these little pickups and some station wagons like Ford Tauruses have them. You put a lot of stuff in the trunk, it opens it up, lets more brake pressure go to the back brake so that it'll stop better because you're going to need more brake in back there if it's heavier back there all of a sudden. Got it? All right, height sensing proportioning valve is what that right there is. Then you got a combination valve, you got your meter and proportion valve all together. I don't give you a lot of information about that because you ain't going to remember it anyway. All right, corroded or misadjusted spark brake cable. 
Uh, this is an adjustment here on your park brake paper. They're one of them. They're like actually a sheet I'm going to give you to adjust the park brakes. Get ready for that. It's coming. Okay. Clog your leaking brake hose. Whenever you hit the brake, let's say you hit the brake and it starts to pull and then it straightens up as you keep stopping. That's typically a brake hose that's partially clogged. And it's taking a little time to get past the clog. You got it? All right. Warren shoe lining, you know, worn pad lining. Now, worn pad linings, are you gonna, is your brake pedal going to feel any different when your pads are wore out? No. no. Because everybody's been here and everybody's heard that scrub, haven't you? That's, it's going to keep stopping as long as it can. The way they got their brakes designed, until there ain't nothing left, it's going to stop that car. Or some people keep driving it until it blows the wheels out and it can't stop the car anymore. All right, make sure you fully understand the symptom. Know what it is they're talking about. Know what it is they're talking about when they come in here. Don't come and say, well, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be working on, but I'm just going to full set of brakes at it. But you can get in trouble that way. I mean, maybe you put brakes on it that it needed, but if you didn't fix the car, you're going to get a comeback. Because they're going to say, I had this problem, and, you know, I paid you this much to fix this car, blah, blah, blah. Which system on the vehicle could be causing the concern? You got zero in on the system. Is this the ABS, or is it the regular service brakes, or has it got something to do with something else? You know, you think about it. you got kind of got a good big picture now. Let's determine the component within the system that's faulty and determine what caused the component to fail. If components fail and then they fail again in a short time, it probably isn't a bad component. It's probably something else that you missed. That makes sense. And occasionally you'll be hearing a noise. Brakes will be stopping just fine. They won't feel anything, but they're going to hear a noise. And occasionally when you hear a noise, uh, you know, if you get in there and you can't feel, see anything wrong, a lot of times you just have to put another set of brake shoes or brake pads on it and see what that does. So they don't cost that much for brake shoes or brake pads. And that noise a lot of times will be, you know, squealing brakes. You heard those? Mm -hmm. uh, they got any semi-metallic fibers and stuff in those arm and pads. And a lot of times they'll, I mean, there may not be anything wrong with it. And the rear brakes are squealing. You can clean the dust out of the drums. A lot of times they fix that. You know, sometimes you just need to throw a new set of shoes or pads on it. And you have to run into that before, too. Ceramic pads don't have about 5% ceramic in them but they're less likely to squeal and dust up your wheels. Verify the concern, drive it, see what you feel. No one understand it, perform a visual inspection, pop the wheels off, see what you see. Look for billet wire and duct tape. Uh, vehicle level of fluid level and condition. Recreate the concern by operating the vehicle and check it for repair history, TSBs. Oasis is online automotive service information system. That was a Ford thing. Remove all the wheels and inspect the brake assembly display. I would see that up here. Visual inspection is, a, to me, is a part of that. Of course, if you see wet brake fluid somewhere, one time uh, the welding instructor came over here on his Chevrolet pickup, as a Duramax, and he said, can you put a master cylinder on my truck? I said, sure. So we popped a master cylinder on it, didn't fix it, uh, because he had low brake pedal, and then somebody happened to notice brake fluid leaking from the back. You know those brake lines that run on the inside of the frame on these pickup trucks? And you know how people that like to go mudding? pack mud up in those frames and it traps that water and that mud running around those brake lines and how they rust out. And now one day you hit the brakes, you go to stop and it feels like you're stepping on a plumb. <laughs> then all of a sudden there's brake fluid coming out of the car will work. You know? And you guys understand about replacing rusty brake lines, right? That's non-negotiable. You know? Don't be a, don't come out, don't halfway fix nobody's brakes and come and say it'd be a right. You know what I'm saying? Because that's a bad scene. All right. That pretty well closes us out for that situation today. And if I give you a pop test tomorrow, how are you going to do on it?